So, uh, yeah, I, I grew up uh, up west of Selby, and I'm south of Selby now. Uh, grew up on a small operation, cattle, hogs, wheat, corn. I was the old wheat summer fallow deal with a little bit of corn for the feed. Um, went off to Brookings to college at 80 to 85, and came back and started farming and running some cows. And, and uh, what just wasn't much money on it, you know. Uh, things weren't going well. <clears throat> um, I wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer anyway. But uh, about mid-90s, I started up a welding business, and I, I welded for about 10 years and farmed on the side. Well, I ran cows. Dad did the farming. And then anyway, Penny did that for a while. And then Basin Electric came along about 2006, 7, right in through there. And I was kind of just barely hanging on and they wanted to buy our land, the old place, to put up a power plant. And uh, they ended up doing that. So all of a sudden, uh, I went from being in debt all the time to, to paying off my debt. And I was out of debt for about a month and a half, and then I bought another place, and now I'm in more debt than I ever was. So you, you kind of slow learners take the money and run, right? But anyway, um, the, I got to do some different things. I got to try things. And uh, about the same time, I went to the South Dakota, well, about 2007. I went on a bus tour up to North Dakota that the South Dakota No-Till Association sponsored. And we went up to Gabe Brown's place and we looked around up there. And we stopped at a place around Linton and I'm not sure who those folks were, but it was a young couple. And they were doing some things different on the cropland side. And we, we checked out Minokin, well, it wasn't Minokin then, it was Burley County's test plot. It was just a little corner where they'd done some things with cover crops and uh, where they planted mon monocultures, they had crop failures because it was so dry the year before. Uh, and where they planted multi-mixed mixes, they'd flourished, even on a dry year. And uh, one of the things I still remember from that tour up there is Gabe Brown standing out in this. And we went up in, in October, late September, tail end of September, first part of October. And Gabe was standing in a, a warm season cover crop mix about this tall. And he was telling us how he was using less fertilizer and less herbicide. And I'm German enough that both of those things appealed to me. You know, a little less inputs and look at all that forage, right? So that kind of got, got me thinking a little different. And I went home and I, it, we'd, we'd finished up combine and beans and I bought some uh, winter triticale and hairy vetch and because uh, Gabe said that was a slam dunk and I threw some turnips in with it and I went out and I planted my first cover crop at, in 2007. And uh, it worked out okay. Uh, got a lot of bills off it and stuff like that. And, and uh, the turnips came the next year and that was, you know how fun that is. You know, you got these turnips out there trying to figure that out. But anyway, a uh, couple years after that, I went to the grazing school that the South Dakota Grass Science Coalition puts on. And I thought I knew a fair amount about grazing. And when I got to that grazing school, I found out there was an awful lot I did not know about grazing. Okay? And I learned quite a bit there. They got me started down the road, and they hooked me up with some people, people like Stan Bowles, people like Jim Falstick. And they had the same kind of mix at that deal that you see here today. They had some experts talking to tell about you know, the new and the latest and greatest technology and you know, the real the meat behind it. And then they had a producer or two talk about what they were doing. Okay? So you got the, the expert side and then you got the guy up there saying, well, I'm doing this and it's kind of working out. And that's kind of the role I'm filling here today. But anyway, the Grasslands Coalition got me thinking different about grazing, more about rotation and the importance of rest. I used to do rotation and then I'd screw it up at the end. I had one pasture system. I'd, I'd rotate through like the four pastures and then the last month of the season, I'd just open the gates and I'd let them go in all of it. So it can't hurt anything. Well, you saw from Stan's presentation that it does hurt things. So I came away from that, that grazing school with a lot of respect for the South Dakota Grass Science Coalition. And they came along about a year or two later, they sent a flyer out and they were having a holistic resource management school. Two, three days, just like that grazing school. And I tell you the truth, I was pretty leery about going. Because when I thought about holistic, I thought about floppy hats and bib overalls and all that stuff, and I don't know. But I had a lot of respect for the Grasslands Coalition, and I still do, and so I went to that. And uh, that was quite an eye-opener. Uh, they talked about looking at the whole picture, and they talked about putting together a holistic goal, and how does, how does your whole family tie into this goal? 
and, and where do you really want to be? And then they talked about grazing management, and they talked about moving cattle every day through pasture systems and the benefit of taking the time to do daily moves and that sort of thing. And I came home and I started moving cattle every day for a while, not thinking I could do this for a long time, but I knew I could do it for a while. You know, maybe I could do it for a month or a couple of weeks. Anyway, so the Grasslands Coalition uh, uh, really affected uh, how, how I looked at things and how I changed on things. And the South Dakota Crop Improvement Association kind of helped light the fire. They got me on the first tour, okay? So uh, this is my wife, Marilee, and uh, you can probably tell by looking that she's a pretty big advocate of cover crops. <laughs> she got, uh, oh, she's pulled a couple of nice bucks out of the cover crops the last few years. Uh, she's a deer hunter. I can't really walk through the damn house. I run into another deer head there by the doors there. And they're nice ones. She, she's in the right spot at the right time a lot. But with the cover crops, we do see uh, a fair amount of wildlife moving into them. I've had neighbors call uh, to get the mix that I use because they have pheasant hunting and that my cover crop fields are where the pheasants usually end up toward the end of the year. You guys have probably noticed that too. This is uh, a picture uh, of Lowry, uh, just taken from the pasture. Uh, see a little wonderful prairie sand right here, but it just kind of shows you a little of the topography of, of where the pastures are. Um, uh, incidentally, I started grazing uh, warm season cover crops, and I'll come to that later. But this this uh, this Lowry system down here has has been my big pasture since forever. That's my big pasture, and we had the 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 first part of this year was as dry as it's ever been up our way. Or it's significantly dry, you know that. And I've been grazing this pasture uh, in the fall, late summer and fall for a long time since I went to that holistic management school that would have been about 2010 or so and I was trying to figure out how to switch up the season of use you know I wanted to get in in the spring instead of the fall all the time anyway so this last year this dry summer uh, I didn't put any cows in it you know the, in the driest deal that we've had in a long time um, I was able to rest that pasture uh, kind of scratching my head at the end of the summer wondering how that all worked out, but it, it's probably because I grazed a lot of cropland on the warm season mixes. <clears throat> Friend of mine, he's sitting in the room over there. Oh yeah, Mr. Hoyle here, he told me early this summer, he says you have to stay light on your feet. You know, a lot of things going on in this drought, this dry deal, stay light on your feet. And uh, uh, Jim Falstick and, and Stan, they, they call that adaptive management. Uh, uh, be ready to change. You know, look at what you got and be ready to change. I made a lot of changes. Um, that's why I'm up here. You don't, need a, you don't need a speaker up here telling you all about how good what you're doing is, okay? You need to be exposed to speakers that are doing some crazy stuff that moves you a little bit off center, okay? So they bring in uh, guys that are doing things a little different uh, and, and we try to move things a little bit. That's what they did for me anyway, too. So I, I switched from uh, late March to May calving. Uh, it be May 15th when I start this year. I, I started doing daily moves for part of the year. Uh, I started to use long rest periods on that pasture that, pastures that we do the daily moves. We might not come back to that for a year. Uh, I try to move uh, every five, six days on corn stalks. This year, I see as the season went on, I, I'm moving about every two weeks, but I start off moving about every five or six days. And it's not, it's not that I think it's not as good. I, apparently, I'm just losing ambition as the winter goes on. <laughs> so, but, uh, but I do that. <clears throat> I rent neighbors' corn stalks. And, uh, and I, want the, I want the neighbors to keep renting my corn stalks. This is a win-win deal for everybody. Livestock are like probiotics for the soil, okay? When the cattle are out on the cropland, they're dropping bacteria and microbes. Whenever they drop some saliva, some urine, some feces, all that stuff stimulates the microbes in the soil. They're not the same microbes, but they're stimulated, okay? So if I put cattle out on your corn stalks, it helps your soil, okay? And it helps me because it's cheap feed, okay? So I want them to be happy with me, and, I, and the, the one thing that always comes up is compaction. Yeah, I'm a little worried about you compacting the soil. So I tell them, well, I'm going to move them every five days. And I do. And you can drive by. I'll give them maybe 30 acres every five days. And you can tell when I'm on that second break, they're not over on the first break. When you're on the third break, 
they're not they're not back and when they start going back you know it's time to step it up a little bit and move them again so I don't think the cattle out there are really a compaction issue okay but I appreciate it that if it's your land you're worried about compaction so I'm doing something that you can see when you drive by to know that I'm addressing compaction okay I'm keeping the cattle moving across the land as a landowner I also will talk to you about a contingency plan let's say we get into a warm spell uh, I don't want them pugging up your field. You don't want them pugging up your field. I'll just share with you that I'm aware of that and I'm going to move them over here uh, back to my pasture or whatever if I have to. Okay, so five day moves on corn stalks. Smaller frame, smaller frame cows, uh, less milk, and I'll cover these through the talk. I, I digress, but I wean my calves at 10 months of age now. Um, I do banding more than I do knife cutting. Uh, no big advantage there except I'm old and I don't want to cut my fingers. Um, I don't give very many shots. I've changed how I market. Uh, I go through a direct, uh, an order buyer as much as I can now. I quit using Purons by six, seven, eight years ago. Um, I don't use ear tags as much. I've planted about two thirds of the cropland back to deep rooted perennials, alfalfa grass. The half of the remaining cropland acres are full season cover crops and I'm grazing more hay ground and I'm trying to buy more hay. So what's with the later calving date? Uh, Justin talk, touched on it a little bit earlier. Uh, it's, it's just way less labor. I'm getting older, I don't wanna work as hard. I wanna run more cows and work less, okay? Uh, I don't pull hardly any calves out of the snowbank in May. It just works easy. Uh, scours is a non-issue. Uh, and like uh, I think Stan said, I wanna mimic nature, uh, or it was Dallas that was mentioned earlier. I wanna mimic nature. If I look around at the deer, I don't see deer out there having fawns in the snowbanks, okay? The deer are having, having their fawns pretty much after the snow is not an issue anymore. Um, I also copy the deer a little bit with my cows with this 10 month weaning. They get a little thin during the winter, but they've got a couple months on grass to fatten back up. Uh, because I'm not so concerned about high weaning weights, and we'll touch on that in a little while, um, I use moderate birth weight bulls now. Uh, I hardly ever buy a bull that's over 82, 83 pound birth weight. For heifers, um, I'm in that 65 to 70 pound range. Uh, and I, I just don't have much trouble, uh, which is good because I'm lazy. Uh, quicker cycling, uh, the later in the year, this is a Dick Divens deal, but the later in the year that you calve, the longer the days are, the quicker those, calves will those cows will start cycling after they've had a calf. So this is what I used to calve. Uh, that was middle of April, the last year I calved in April. And I keep some pictures around, you can see a calf right there. But I keep some pictures around. I had to have one on my phone as a screen staver for the first couple of years to remind myself, yes, this is why I don't want to turn the bulls out, yes. Because yeah. it just feels like June 20th, I should turn the damn bulls out. It's not so hard anymore, but it was at first. But anyway, I didn't want to do that anymore. Uh, and I didn't want to do it because I'd been exposed to people that talked about an easier way. Okay, this is what I do now. Okay, uh, you know, this is a cow, this is rye back here. Uh, you can ask Dan about this, but I'm a little bit of a proponent and advocate for rye. Uh, I didn't plant any this year. I planted some the two years before this. But uh, rye is a tremendous tool. Uh, you plant that rye, you take your shovel out and you dig it up later, and my God, there's a root mass under there. It's like <coughs> sod. It's uh, when these roots die off, you're doing a lot of things to replenish your soil with your organic matter. When, the, when you got a lot of residue on top of the ground, most of these cropland fields around here, we're trying to get more residue on. And on some of it, uh, I plant right into the rye without doing anything. But anyway, uh, calving, talk about the subject here, Doug. Calving, uh, I do it on grass now instead of in the mud and the snow. Uh, it really works well. I went to smaller cows uh, and uh, uh, a cow eats about 3% of her body weight every day, right? So 10, 1,500 pound cows will eat the same as 15, 1,000 pound cows. You've got 15,000 pounds of cows either way. 10 times 15 times 3%, 450 pounds a day, 82 tons a year. The smaller cows, 15 smaller ones, 10,000 pounds, 3%, three, 3%, I don't know, 82 tons. Same amount of feed. 10 big cows, 15 little cows. 
can, let's assume that they each wean 50% of their body weight. Uh, I don't think the big cows are as good at doing that as the small cows are, but let's give everybody the benefit of the doubt and make simple math. If they wean 50% of their body weight, 10, 750 pound calves, 7,500 pounds of calves on the big cows, 15 times 500, 7,500 pounds of calves on the little cows, okay? So the big calves bring in $12,375. The little calves bring in $15,000. pounds in favor of the, or dollars in favor of the big, uh, the small calves. And would you rather have a check from a semi-load of big calves or a semi-load of small ones? Uh, the check for a semi-load, $22,500 difference. Same amount of feed, big cows and little cows. Okay? Something to think about. Okay? Uh, improved rotation, what, the, what I eventually found out and caught on to, and they, it's not that they weren't telling me this, but what I finally heard was that the longer, uh, the improved rotations mean longer rest periods in the, in the pastures. And that's where the big benefit comes in. Okay? It's not... It, some of it's not chewing so short, sure, but a lot of the benefit and the health we do to our pastures is doing something about extending the rest period, okay? So I, I started doing the one to five day moves and I increased my stock density. Uh, the grass starts growing back three to five days after you bite it off. Uh, when you pack them in a little tighter, you've got increased harvest efficiency, so you pick up a little that way. They just eat more of what's there. Uh, they step more down too, which turns out that's a good thing. You want to get the residue down on the ground where the soil microbes can get at it and chew on it. If that old dead grass is just sitting up in the air, uh, it's just going to evaporate. It's a different word for it, but that's basically what it does. Get it down on the ground and uh, those bugs can chew it up and turn it into to, uh, nutrients. This deal with moving the cows every day uh, turns into some extraordinary rest periods on the pasture. Uh, what, I, what I started doing on that system, let's say this was a pasture that I'd be in uh, for 100 days, sometime during the summer. I just started doing football field strips with poly wire. Greatest thing since sliced bread, this poly wire. And above ground water line comes right behind it. But anyway, this is the first football field, and the first day I let them go to the 20 yard line and eat. And they come back here to the end zone and drink. The next day they go to the 40, come back to the end zone, 60, 80, doing five day runs, okay? Then I come over to this one. Just flip, it takes three poly wires, right? And just flip this one over here before you move them. Well, the one in the pickup you put over here. Anyway, another five day run. And uh, this, this deal here, we're gonna come back here next year. Okay, so this rested 360 days before I came and hit it again, okay? What I saw when I started doing that, I didn't see dramatic increases in production. Okay, but I sure saw things like big blue stem and Indian grass start to take off, okay, start to spread. And I, they were probably there before, but the way I grazed them off, they'd grow a little bit and the cows would chew them off and, you know. So level plane of nutrition, if I move them like that, they're getting a level plane, Let's, like a salad bar, right? Okay, so the pasture, the cornfield, grazing the cropland and diverse mixes, they're all like a salad bar. So you go out, I, I go, I go to the salad bar, and you watch me, I'll do it today. If they've got chocolate pudding on the salad bar, that's what I'm gonna eat, if you guys aren't watching. But I'm gonna eat that chocolate pudding, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on that chocolate pudding until it's gone, if you'll let me. And when it's gone, I'm gonna move to the potato salad, okay, next best tasting thing, and, and I'll work on that, and, and uh, when I get done with that, I'll go to the lettuce, right? But if you come back and you put out more pudding before I get done with the potato salad, I'm gonna go back to the pudding. I don't wanna eat the lettuce, okay? Cows are the same thing. Out in the pasture, you've got these chocolate pudding plants. Really tastes good, right? You've got the potato salad plants, you've got the, the lettuce plants. If I give that cow that whole pasture season long continuous graze, those chocolate pudding plants get hit hard right away. And pretty soon they say, screw this, and they just hunker down. Okay? They don't die, we, we used to think they died, but most of them they don't, they just hunker down and they say, no, I'm not growing back, he's just gonna bite me off. And some of those chocolate pudding plants actually take a, like a two year rest before they'll start showing up again. Okay? Anyway, what am I getting at? So if I use this system here, it's more like making them eat something from the whole salad bar all the way down the line. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
you give up a little, you give up a little um, on pounds a game per head. But you pick it up because you can put more head out there. Okay? Some of that's from the increased production and some of it's from that harvest efficiency. If we're doing a take half, leave half deal, maybe we're really only using 25% of the grass out there. Okay? With this high density grazing, maybe you're using up around 40% of the grass. Okay? So anyway, some of it's just because they're eating more. This is a system where, where I did the uh, daily moves. That's all high tensile single strand wire now. And then this is a vacation pasture because I got to get the heck out of here once in a while. But these, uh, I don't move every day all the time. And what, I'll, what I've done down here the last couple days is move like every three to five days. And it seems to be working pretty well. Uh, the, I don't know. Um, the, some of the casual observers that you wouldn't think would notice that the pastures are doing better notice. Mom was up at coffee last summer and, and one of the neighbor gals was talking, said everybody's pasture looks pretty rough except for Doug's. Uh, of course, Doug hadn't had any cattle in it right along the road. But anyway, uh, it, it, some of that stuff, it, it, a lot of people can notice that. But anyway, we put in a water tank there and a water tank uh, down here. Equip helped me do that. Dennis, the gang from Selby, they've helped me through an awful lot of stuff where I've floundered around. Uh, Dennis and NRCS and Equip also helped me figure out the fencing and, and pay for it. And, and uh, just I can't say enough good things about Dennis and the, the crew in Selby there. But anyway, I've, I've since started using some above ground water line too. There's a hydrant down in this corner, and uh, I just dragged that inch and a half poly pipe around. Uh, the place is about two and a half miles up here, and when I need the pipe, I just hook on with the pickup and I drag it down the ditch. And uh, you can drag a 2,000 feet of pipe behind a pickup, no problem. Uh, if it's empty and the train isn't too bad, you can dra drag it behind a four-wheeler pretty good too. But that, that above ground water line, that is slick. This is the old home place where I grew up and this, I planted, this used to all be cropland. I planted most of this back to grass. Uh, I've got a, uh, I don't know, 80 acres here that was corn this year. And this was warm season cover crop over here that I grazed. And uh, I'm just kind of flipping back and forth. One year warm season cover crop mix and one year corn uh, in the, okay. So we're grazing with this, with this moving more often. Uh, we're grazing more grasses taller. Uh, not all the time like this, but I don't know. It's, once in a while it's fun to have a picture of the grass taller than the cows. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is uh, Canadian thistle here, uh, like Dan touched on. Uh, there are certain times of the year my cows eat Canadian thistle really well. Uh, I've got a Facebook page. Uh, if you go to that Facebook page, I've got a video of uh, even some baby calves biting the blossoms off this Canadian thistle. Uh, Facebook page is Deep Rut Ranch, whatever you do with Facebook. But anyway, look around on Facebook for that if you want to see the video, it's there. Uh, there's also a video, I think, of some dung, be dung beetles doing some stuff. Oh yeah, there it is right there. How about that? Um, you know, <clears throat> I'm not sure what this is, but they ate the crap out of it. <laughs> I take these pictures and I don't remember. It might be milkweed. That's a Diet Pepsi can there. Um, but anyway, whatever, whatever it was, like Stan said, it changed from being a weed to being a forage material. Uh, this might be milkweed here. Uh, milkweed, I don't think you're supposed to let cows eat them, something about it being poisonous, but my cows eat a lot of poisonous things and they seem to do okay. Um, livestock integration, we talked a little, I like to graze corn stalks, it's cheap, it's about half the cost of, of hay. Uh, how much is out there? It's about half the cost for me of feeding hay. Okay, So if I can rent your corn stalks for, I don't know, 70 cents a cow or 60 cents a cow, maybe 80 cents a pair, or something like that. It's about half of what I think I'd have to spend if I bought hay. So how much is out there? You've got the same pounds of corn stover as you do corn grain, okay? So if you've got 5,600 pounds, 100 bushel corn, if you've got 5,600 pounds of corn, you've got about 5,600 pounds of corn stover per acre. Okay. Cow eats about 1,500 pounds a month if it's a you know, big cow. Uh, so given a cow an acre a month of corn stalks, that's not taking hardly anything away from leaving residue out there. Okay. Oh yeah, here's the cost deal. 
Okay. So for every 100 cows, I figure I save $3,500 a month. That's pretty good wages, you know. Um, it's a good idea. If you haven't done it before, and you guys maybe all have, and I'm sorry if I'm preaching to the choir here, but if you wanna, you're grazing during the winter and you've got snow to deal with, you wanna train these cows on a big fencer, okay? You want them to have quite a bit of respect for that fence so that when it snows out there and they're standing on this much snow, that they still respect that fence because it won't zap them near as much, will it? Um, if you don't, if you don't wanna spend the 1500 for a big fencer, by the way, Ken Cove has a pretty damn good fencer for about 600 now. I bought one last summer after Cam Wall's thing zapped out my other one. And uh, anyway, that $600 fencer is working pretty good. I don't remember how many joules it is. But anyway, if you don't want to spend that much money on a fencer, what you can do is, is go by your water source over here, take any old fencer you've got, and run two wires uh, close to that tank where when they drink they're going to lodge around and bump into it, and run one of the wires hot and one of the wires of ground and just have that the only fence that that fencer is charging they'll get a pretty damn good shock off that and they'll start to learn okay i got to respect this um i don't know but i use i use big fencers around the yard as long as i can and so by the time winter rolls around they're pretty respectful um i've had the string lay on the ground and and they still respect it okay i've had the string lay on the ground and they haven't respected it so <laughs> but but they They'll, um, yeah. Oh, I should say, this whole deal of cornstalk grazing, I'm glad Justin Thompson's here today. His dad's really the one that taught us that we could graze cornstalks a lot more efficiently than we did, and he taught us just by letting us watch him. Back in 2006, it was bone dry up there, and we were grazing whatever we could. And about that time, we started noticing what we did with cornstalk grazing when I was a kid is we'd turn the cows out on the cornstalks, and after about a week, we'd start feeding them a little hay because we felt sorry for them. Well, they did the whole chocolate pudding deal. You know, they said, huh, he's feeding us hay, we're not going out. We watched Daryl, and heck, Daryl grazed those, those cows until February, March. And so we figured out we could do this different and do it longer. And, uh, and I, I have to thank your dad sometime. We've never visited about that. He also taught you to use a bigger fencer, probably. <laughs> could be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's learning curves with all of that. But anyway, um, water, if I've got a quarter of corn stalks that doesn't have water, and I've got snow, I don't worry about it. Uh, my cows do just fine licking snow. I didn't think that would be true. I learned that up in Burley County and they learned it from the guys in Canada. Um, I've gone a month at a time uh, on some neighbor's corn stalks with no water and the cows seem to do okay. Um, first year I did it, I kind of like this, you know, and if you do it, you turn them out there and like the next day you go check on them, they're gonna be bellering and honor, you know, not happy with you at all, okay? You learn to check from a distance for a couple, three days, and then they kind of get over it. And anyway, that first time I left them out on this quarter for about two weeks, and it was at home where we used to let them back and forth for water. And uh, I, let them, I let them across, and they knew where to go to get a drink. It was a half mile down the line. And I thought, I'll mess with you just a little bit. So they're, they're kind of going that way, and I turn, I, come on, and I led them up to the corn stalks that were, and they went right to grazing corn stalks. They didn't, they weren't worried about running home and getting a drink. So anyway, that was kind of interesting. When I'm fencing on corn stalks, I use a lot of poly wire and O'Brien original posts, okay? The O'Brien originals, that's a big deal, okay? The O'Brien original, I get them from Ken Cove, they're about $4 a post. Uh, they make this, this poly wire fencing so much easier. You can get them in in the frozen ground, okay? If you don't have a hammer, you look for a corn root or some kind of plant root and you can work them in. You don't have to go in that, you know, that far, I'll hold it if it's froze. But if you don't want to do that, you can tap them in with a hammer and they'll hold together. These posts, you get at runnings that have a spike on the bottom that's as big as your finger. They're, you can't get them in, you can't get them out, the posts break. Uh, those O'Brien originals, that's the way to go. Uh, less milk, what's the deal with less milk? Don't we want bigger calves, more milk? Well, I'm not that worried about bigger calves anymore. Remember the, the bigger check for the smaller calves. Um, so high milk producing cows don't just take more feed when they're milking. High milk producing cows take more feed all year long. They're just less efficient, okay? So I've started going away from high milk EPDs uh, I want cows that provide enough milk for the calf to grow, but that's it, okay? Main thing I want is for that cow to breed back, okay? 
Uh, open cows are pretty expensive. Uh, you all know that, that's no brainer. But anyway, it, fertility is your biggest money maker. Um, what, I, what I need to be doing, well, it says expect fallout. When you make changes like this, when you start kind of roughing them out there, there's going to be some fallout, okay? And the guys told me that was going to happen, and you, you just need to expect it. And the theory is you get rid of the ones that can't do it, and your, your quality of your herd will improve. And you, I look at that all the time. Like right now, the calves are on the cows yet, and I leave them there until about the 1st of March, and this cow is pretty skinny, and this cow is looking pretty good, okay? Same feed, same cows. I, I need more of the fat cows, the more of the good condition cows that are still raising a calf. Okay? At least for me. I, I don't mean to tell you guys what you need to do. This weaning at 10 months, uh, that, I remember people that used to leave their calves on a little too long, and when I was riding around with my friends in the neighborhood, we ridiculed them because they weren't getting their calves weaned on time. And now I'm, now I'm the guy that they drive by and say, why are his calves still out there? But my cows work for me. I don't work for my cows anymore. Okay, um, I don't start the tractor up every day. I don't haul feed out every day. I will if it's a really bad winter, but they're working for me now instead of the other way around. Doesn't seem like that sometimes, but that cow becomes a source of a high protein supplement for the calf, okay? The cow's not milking very much anymore this time of year. It's just a little bit of milk, but it's enough to give that calf a little extra protein kick, right? Calves look great, okay? Um, and like I said, expect some cows to fall out of the herd, okay? This is uh, grazing corn, unharvested corn. We'll talk about that in a minute, but that's typical picture. You got the cows out there and you got the calves and I don't know, they're weighing 550, I don't know, something like that. Okay, bale grazing. I, get, I learned about bale grazing up at Burley County. Um, those guys up in North Dakota shook up my thinking on a whole lot of things. I didn't believe them at first. Uh, they talked about putting out a, all this hay and, and just turning the cows out into it. And, and uh, Gabe talked about, uh, he said, oh, I give them seven to 10 days worth at a time. And I thought, I doubt it. And uh, I came back and I, I thought I could try it with maybe four days worth at a time and see what happens. So I started carrying it out, take about four days worth, out, four minutes, five minutes. Wow, we're going to step this up a little. So uh, anyway, uh, Ran into a guy in Canada up there, and he said that he puts out a month's worth at a time. I thought, well, if he can do a month's worth at a time, I can do a week's worth. So I started doing this, and there's about 17 bales in a row there. And going across here, I was giving them two rows uh, about every five days. Okay? It's easy. I like easy. Uh, I don't have to start a tractor. I put out the same amount of hay that I would put out if I were rolling bales out. So if I were rolling out 10 bales a day, I, I just give them 10 bales sitting like this. I leave the twines on, right or wrong. Um, the better quality hay, you have less residue. Some I turned on and they had net wrap. I thought, boy, I'm clever. I'll just put that, I'll cut that off as I go. I didn't realize net wrap wraps under the, around the edge. So okay, well, it wasn't quite so clever, but uh, worked through it. Uh, they kind of go back and forth, eat the different bales. This is what we did last winter. Mary and I had some health troubles, and she had surgery at the end of December, first part of January. So some neighbors came over, and uh, we, we put out about uh, two weeks' worth of bales. Uh, we put out about a month's worth of bales, actually. And we just gave them two weeks' worth at a time, make it easy on the neighbors. It worked just fine. Uh, cows, they eat through them. You can see the calves on the cows out there yet. Um, Sorry about that. That's uh, snow build up underneath the, the bale circle. So I think what happens, this is really tremendous. You're going to see some neat pictures later on on regrowth. What happens is uh, that hay covers that snow and those cows lay on that old bale circle and that snow is trapped underneath. And in the spring, things start thawing and that ground around that circle thaws off, right? Opens up. And the last thing to melt is that bale circle. So instead of all that manure, juice and residue running down the creek, it runs out and it soaks in, okay? So uh, it's a pretty good way of hanging on to your nutrients. That's an O'Brien original post there, by the way. They make them in yellow, white, and blue. Uh, that's, a, that's a bale circle. Some are better, some are worse. In two years, you won't even notice it was there, uh, except it'll be better in two years there. 
That's what it looks like shortly after grazing. So you leave some behind, but you leave some behind uh, no matter what you do. This is what happened when we got about an inch of rain when they were on it. Thought, oh boy, that's a disaster. <laughs> Notice the two trees in the background there. That's the regrowth on it. Yeah, you can't even tell where it was anymore. That's a, I do get some Canadian thistle in the bale circles. It's uh, something you gotta deal with. Oh, the cows here, how do you know when your cows are eating enough? Left side of the cow, notice how that's not dented in right there? Right side of the cow, it's all hollowed out. If I drove out and looked at the right side of my cow, I'd say, oh no, she's not getting enough to eat. Uh, eh, she's doing okay. My cows are liars, that's why I bring that up. You go to move every day and they lie like heck to you. I come out to move them and they see me and they start bellowing, ah! You know, and you know they're starving to death. They can be standing in grass that deep and, you, and they're bellering like they're starving. They're just a bunch of liars. So I needed to learn some ways to not, not believe them. This is this summer. Okay, this is the end of June when it was so dry up there. Um, you, you know, pretty obvious. Where we bale graze, we had grass. Okay, uh, five feet over where we didn't bale graze, it was brown and it was about that tall. Okay, tremendous difference. Uh, same story here. You see right where the rows of bales were. <coughs> so I've liked bale grazing. Uh, I like it even more after last year. Um, two minutes left. <laughs> okay, full season cover crops. So I, I decided I started out cover crops after wheat. Uh, and I decided, well, I didn't decide, I was listening to Jay Fearon, and, and people were asking him the same question we all ask the first time Jay starts talking about cover crops. They say, well, we don't have enough moisture after weed harvest to grow them up here. And Jay said, why don't you go with full season cover crops? Dedicate a whole year to the cover crop. I thought, hmm, I wonder if I could do that. So I did that. I started coming back and doing oats and peas, and then I screwed it up. I cut the oats and peas for hay and baled it and carried it off. So I was still taking all the nutrients off the field. But I told myself, I'm going to cut that off, and I'm going to plant a second one behind it. Because Gabe had said, you don't really start getting the, the full benefit until you have two full season, or two cover crops in one season. But I never got the second one planted. That's where rye came in. I got to thinking, I'll make myself do it. So I started planting winter rye after wheat. And that really worked well. All the neat things with rye, and then after the rye, I planted a warm season cover crop mix. Okay, um, that warm season cover crop is a good tool to fill the warm season slump. Okay, um, cool season grasses are good grasses. Okay, they're not as good as some. Okay, but we've got them. We've got smooth brome. We've got Kentucky bluegrass. We've got these. We got to learn to work with them and take advantage of them. Right. They're, they're not bad, they're just bad later on in the year when, when they're all dried up, okay? Uh, I'll touch on that, maybe I'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, but anyway, this deal with the warm season cover crop, uh, I can chew off about 4,000 pounds on there. You can grow 6,000 pounds without much fertilizer. Uh, Alan Williams says that if you can grow 130 bushel corn, you can grow 8,000 pounds of forage. Uh, on Dan's field over here last year, 11,000 pounds? Yeah, it had 8,300 to dry. Yeah, so, okay, so you can grow a lot of forage out there, uh, and uh, that's a pretty good money maker for me. I graze it sometimes late, uh, sometimes earlier, depends on the class of cattle. Um, I do plant, I try to plant maybe 40 or 50 acres with more pearl millet and hardly any sedan grass in, so that when it freezes, I don't have to worry about the prussic acid. I go to that pearl millet mix for that two weeks or whatever, because it takes, you know, it takes two weeks. It never freezes once freezes and kind of kills it, and then it comes back, then it kind of freezes again, right? So you really need a couple of weeks worth. Though, yeah. That's, a, that's kind of a handy deal there. That's just a Menards or Runnings uh, ice fishing sled, calf sled, strapped on with bungee cords. Uh, you can fit your posts in there pretty good. Uh, you've seen that kind of stuff. This is a nice way to wind up a half a mile of string, a quarter mile at a time. Uh, threaded rod through a spool. Uh, that pipe there, just stick the pipe on that threaded rod, hold it like this, and, and you can wind it up to beat hell. If you get to the real avid string grazers, they say, oh, you got to walk along and wind it up because your, your string won't last as long if you drag it to you. I don't care, okay? I got a lot of stuff to do. I'll buy more string, right? Okay. You can see the, the diversity in that warm season mix. Uh, sedan grass, German hay millet, pearl millet, uh, 
We got the turnips and radishes. I like rapeseed more than turnips and radishes these days. I'll throw some kind of kale, hunter brassica, something like that. That kale's amazing, it stays green like forever. Uh, notice that in my wife's garden. But anyway, I try to mix it up like you would a native pasture. Uh, I don't get anywhere near the 50 or 60 species. But uh, then you can see what's left behind, okay? I can graze off 4,000 pounds and still leave that kind of cover behind. And I sent a test of that in this year. So I only got an hour left. I sent a test of that in this year just to see what am I leaving behind. And it's actually pretty good stuff. It's like 59 TDN and it had 25 on net energy for gain, okay? But I don't feel bad about that. Um, I got to feed the bugs too, you know? But I was feeling bad because these cows were going back and they were eating out there kind of picking up that, that stuff off the ground in between water deals. And I thought, my God, I'm starving them. I wasn't. They were short on protein. It was low on protein, but it was good. I graze unharvested corn. I'll leave about 30 acres each year. I'll, I'll leave 30 rows. I'll combine six. I'll leave 30. I'll combine six. You can see that. I left. I combined up the field that way. Up the field this way, you can see the cows are. Give them about a half an acre a day. Um, this is where I combine crosswise across the field so I can run the string, got a nice place that they recognize. Uh, it, it really works well. Uh, 10 pounds of corn and 10 pounds of corn stalks keeps them pretty happy. Costs you less than a buck a day. I got to thinking if they can do it out in the field, why not behind the trees? So I took this gravity wagon and I modified the door and uh, I got a bin with electric auger on, I just time it and I'll put in my 10 pounds or 15 or whatever I want to do to fatten them up a little bit and I'll go out and feed them like that. Fed them like that for a month last year. Did good. Uh, you, then I give them about two bales of hay a day. That's about 200 cows. So I gave them about, uh, I think it was a, a, a 10, 15 pounds of corn and about two bales of hay for the bunch. Uh, they'll eat. When, when that's all the hay they've got to pick from, they'll eat anything you take out there. If you've got some cruddy hay. But they're getting all the energy through this. And then when I'm grazing in the field or grazing here, I'll give them uh, alfalfa on Mondays and Thursdays. Twice, twice a week they get alfalfa. Uh, yeah, I won't run through that. That's pretty good, though. Uh, but I'm not going to run through it. But you can, you can uh, graze this cool season grass early. Graze the crap out of your cool season grass. Put your cows all together. And then uh, graze the warm season cover crops. Takes about an acre for two months for a cow or something like that. Uh, corn and alfalfa. Uh, and that was given 10 pounds of alfalfa every day. 10 pounds every day. And anyway, my cost was 484 per cow. Okay. So you can, you can do this stuff I'm talking about and make it, make it work pretty well. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It takes a, takes a lot longer to cut, bale, stack, and haul hay than you think. Figure it out sometime. Cover crops, we've talked about that. This is, so, this is rye stubble here. Um, I know I'm going over, but this is, I think this is important stuff. I planted this, this soybean. These soybeans got planted into standing rye. Um, I planted the rye after the wheat, so it was winter rye. Went out there and sprayed the rye when it was about that tall, because up here crop insurance says you have to spray 10 days before you plant. So that's what we did. Went in and planted into that tall stuff. It was hard to see the markers, but, uh, but the kid did pretty good. And uh, we had all kinds of mulch on the ground there. That might actually be one that I grazed first, that field, because there's not as much mulch. But anyway, there's mulch, all kinds of rye mulch on the ground there. Uh, we sprayed it. I sprayed it uh, before we planted, and then I sprayed it again when the beans are up about this tall. Pretty much just with some Roundup to take out the grasses. Broadly, it's weren't much of an issue. And I've got a lot of mare's tail problems up there. So I was pretty impressed with that. This is when we harvested that field. Still good cover on the ground. Um, and this was the next year I planted uh, uh, beans. We harvested the beans, and the next year, last year, I went out there and I planted uh, oats and peas last spring in that field. And that's how much cover was still left on the ground. That bean ground did not blow at all during the winter. Uh, quit using insecticides. You can ask me about that if you're curious. That's some kind of strange insect. I don't know what it is, but I thought it looked cool. So big green eyes. That, uh, this, I, I drove by that for a lot of years. It's in a pasture I rent for my cousin. And I never stopped to look and see what that is. I finally went and looked the other day or last summer. That's a, a, a grass seeder. He's got an old axle down there, and the differential spins this plate here. This 50-gallon barrel has a little slide on the bottom, and that's what they seeded grass with, I guess. So anyway, use what you got. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, the less questions you ask, the sooner you get to eat, I'm thinking. <laughs>